boo. If I could sum up my thoughts on Pokemon Black and White in one picture, if I could completely encapsulate how I feel about these games and how I feel about how other people feel about these games in one image, it would be Simi Sears' sprite art from the games. What emotion is that? What is he feeling? Is he disgusted? Is he a bit uneasy? Is he queasy? He looks kinda sick. He looks very unsure. Does he know how he feels? Do I know how I feel? No. I don't think I do. I don't know. Pokemon Black and White are very confusing to me. When I first played these games, having previously been a Pokemon fan all my life, having played starting from generation two onwards, I found for the first time disappointment. I couldn't put my finger on it, but something about it just felt wrong. I just wasn't getting the same sense of glee and just sheer enjoyment that I got from previous Pokemon games. I wasn't really old enough to have developed a critical eye at the time, but I just knew that something was off as far as I was concerned. I'd just come off of Generation 4, which I absolutely adored and put tons of time into. I finished the whole Pokedex in that game. I played it for countless hours. The internet wasn't really that readily available around the time of Generation 4, so I remember going to the local library a lot to look up the Sinnoh Pokedex on Cerebinet so that I could finish it in the game because I was missing one Pokemon and I could not figure out for the life of me what it was. It turned out to be Munchlax, who has a 1% chance of spawning from one of any four randomly generated trees. It was a grind, even before Munchlax was the only Pokemon I had left. I was constantly having to frequent the library and go back and forth and back and forth to use Cerebinet and use the internet to patch up all these holes in the Pokedex and find all these Pokemon that I had no other way of finding. Yeah, it was inconvenient, sure, but I liked it. I was good at it. That's how much I cared about Generation 4, that's how much it sucked me in. When Black and White were announced, I was obviously ecstatic. I was so ready to do that kind of thing all over again. I remember when the games were first revealed. Uh, for a long time leading up to that point, I'd been following this YouTuber called Gigatitan who did Wi-Fi battles on Pokemon Battle Revolution. Remember that game? Uh, and I was watching a video of him reacting to the announcement and he was just as excited as I was. And he was showing off the front covers and talking all about it. It looked promising. These new legendary Pokemon looked cool. They had this whole kind of yin yang thing going on and obviously everyone loved Zekrom because he was cool and he was black and you know. And then as any other OGs such as myself would remember, the Pokedex leaked early. And it was only then when I was following the first live leaks of the Pokedex as a little kid late at night on Cerebinet that I experienced that little sinking feeling. But before I get into that and my very complicated feelings on Pokemon Black and White, give me one more minute of preamble real quick. If you haven't seen my other videos on Pokemon X and Y and Sun and Moon respectively, then know that this is effectively the final part of a trilogy. If you're wondering why this is a trilogy and I'm not covering every main series Pokemon game, then that is better explained in the X and Y video. I'm not gonna lie to you like most other YouTubers would and tell you that those other videos are mandatory viewing if you wanna understand this video, but no that they are related and I'm going to be referring back to them quite a lot and talking about things that I've said about other Pokemon games previously. I think it'd be great if you watched them. It helped me out a lot because uh, I haven't shoved any exaggerated facial expressions onto any of my thumbnails so YouTube doesn't like me very much. And hey here's my first reference to them because in the Sun and Moon video I talked about all the things that I liked about Sun and Moon first because ultimately I disliked Sun and Moon and wanted to put the focus on what I thought was bad about it and did the exact exact opposite for X and Y. And because my feelings on black and white are so kind of complicated, I'm not really sure how to apply that kind of approach here. So I've decided I'm not gonna. I'm gonna keep this a lot less structured. No transitions or text on screen telling you what I thought was good or what I thought was bad. I'm just gonna kind of talk about it as I go and a general idea of my opinion and how I feel about these games should form over time without me having to be particularly explicit about it. So we should probably do that. Pokemon black and white when everything changed whoa i'm i'm, I'm bad at intros and uh, title you can you can read the title stop being weird darumaka looks like a used tampon and nothing else oh i did it <laughs> Oh my God. You know, I just did this like five minute intro with all this preamble and the whole time in the back of my head, I was just like, say it, say it, say it. I was waiting. There it is. Darumaka looks like a used tampon. I said it. Your mask? More like you're done. Whoever designed this Pokemon, you're done. Because I mean, what even is that? Like, 
<laughs> no, seriously, what is that? I literally, I can't tell. Cryogonal. Cry. Cry. Uh. I'm crying. I'm crying right now because this Pokemon looks like shit. Question time. What's your favorite legendary Pokemon? Mewtwo? Pretty solid choice. Had a very good showing in the first movie. He's been marketed very heavily. Mewtwo is just kind of cool, man. Very respectable decision. What about Dialga? Look at that design. He's a dragon who has control over time. That's an incredible concept. What about Green Man on Cloud? How do you feel about, how do you feel about Green Man on Cloud? Wait, hang on. I'm not done. Are you ready for this? BAM! Blue man on cloud. <laughs> now these guys, these guys are pretty cool. Are you ever playing a Pokemon game and you just think to yourself, man, I really want just a, a guy on a cloud in my team. Of course you do, but the problem is that they only come in blue and green, and maybe you're not feeling blue and green. <laughs> Slow down, Buster Brown, because I'm about to change your world. Are you ready for this? Sit tight. <clears throat> Brown man on cloud. Yeah, I don't like the Generation 5 Pokemon designs very much. I had to get this one out of the way first because it is just the one that eats away at me the most. This is a totally subjective thing, so I'm well aware that this is all just a matter of taste. But for me, I think a large majority of the Pokemon that were introduced in Generation 5 are just hideous. And it's a weird one because at the same time, Generation 5 introduces a small cluster of the coolest Pokemon ever introduced. Chandelure, Galvantula, Crocodile, Cofagrigus, Bishop, Mandibuzz. God, these guys are so cool and they're so well designed and it's just like, what happened to the rest of you? I'm, I'm very concerned that all of this complaining that I've done is going to make some people hate me right off the bat but I just, I had to get it out there. I'm sorry if you like these Pokemon, but if you ask me, Generation 5 just got hit with the ugly stick. Again, this is very subjective and very down to personal taste, so I'm, I'm sorry to go on about it for so long, but for me, it genuinely did negatively affect my enjoyment quite a lot because I struggled to build a team in Unova because so many of the Pokemon, as far as I'm concerned, would just really really not nice looking and no i'm not angry about the ice cream and i'm not angry about the trash bag because my thing is for the most part i think what makes a good pokemon design or what i like to see in a pokemon design is some kind of proof of concept right more often than not as long as i can see some kind of idea or concept at play behind the design of a pokemon i can get behind it i like features i like a personality a lot of the pokemon i dislike in unova are either ones where i really struggle to find the concept at play or if I can find the concept at play then it's very very hard to decipher on a first look and I feel like if you have to look up what a Pokemon is supposed to be based on or you just have no idea what it's supposed to be based on until someone else tells you or you somehow bump into that information then I don't think it's a particularly well designed Pokemon. Some exceptions can be made of course as is the case with all things especially if they're based off of uh, things from like another culture that you're not familiar with that's fine. Yes a Pokemon being an ice cream is a bit silly and the being a trash bag is a bit silly but I mean hey be it be it a pokeball is a bit silly you know being a hot dog's a bit silly at least I can tell what the ice cream and the trash bag are supposed to be Darumaka if you ask me is the pinnacle of this it's just a red circle with these hideous eyes and really no features or traits to speak of. I found out the other day that apparently it's supposed to be based off of a Daruma doll, hence the name, and it's significantly better looking evolution with Darmanitan, but can you see that? I absolutely cannot see that. If this is the concept, I think it's horrendously executed here. Cryogonal is supposed to be a snowflake, but again, there's nothing to it. There's nothing going on here. It's just a shape, and I know you're going to say, well, a snowflake's just a shape, and you're absolutely right. Well done. Here Here's how Pidgey looks in your world. God, I am just toxic in this video. <laughs> I personally feel like so many of the Pokemon in black and white are just featureless or devoid of personality. But hey, it's fine. I'm not going to go on about it any longer. I've gotten to talk about pretty much all of the ones I want to- Oh no, I forgot about you. You are truly just the worst, aren't you? You are the pinnacle of bad Pokemon design. You are not even a Pokemon. You are just a thing. You are literally just a floating object. 
Is there anything worse than Sigalith? I don't think there is. I've heard that Sigalith is supposed to be based on some kind of totem poles or something like that, and I've seen pictures of, of the object in question a few years ago, and I, I vaguely remember thinking, oh wow, that does actually look quite a lot like Sigalith, but that doesn't make it okay. You could make a Pokemon based off of a camera, and you could make it look literally exactly like a camera. It could just be a camera with no extra features. Yeah, there is a clear concept at play there, but it's still an awful, awful design. Sigalith is just a floating object with no features, and I hate it. There, I'm done. I'm finally done complaining about the Pokemon designs. I know it's been 10 minutes, but I just needed to get that monkey off my back. That hideous red monkey with an expression that seems to speak to every emotion at once, and somehow no emotions. Who designed you, Simisir? Who created you? What have they done to you? Let's talk about the other big thing about these games that irks me a lot, and that's the plot. Although it might be inaccurate to say that it's just the plot that bothers me, because it's also people's reception to the plot, especially when the games first came out. It seemed to be a huge point of praise for people. These Pokemon games have the best story that a main series Pokemon game has ever told. I feel like you heard people praising these games' plot a lot, and I think maybe that that's made me dislike it even more than I already did. The bar for best main series Pokemon game plot had already been set incredibly low, and in fact the plots were pretty much non-existent in previous games. The closest thing you ever had to a plot was why the evil team are doing what they're doing, and why the legendary Pokemon are shooting laser beams everywhere. I really think that in the case of Black and White, people were mistaking a focus on plot for a good plot. Pokemon Black and White made much more of an an attempt to actually have a plot and put the focus on the story of the games, but that didn't mean it was good. And it's a shame for me to say that because I respect the shift in direction that the franchise took in putting more focus on the story, and the, the angle that they came at it from had a lot of potential. The story of these games are based around trying to answer a question that the fan base had been asking internally for years now, and I love that. I love that they addressed an actual question that the fans had been pondering over, and that question obviously was about the morality of catching and having and battling Pokemon. Is it okay to just catch these living creatures and just have them fight each other, kind of almost for sport? It's a really interesting question and a very interesting dilemma to delve into, and then it just turns out to to be the most uninteresting thing ever. For a long time, the game seems to be playing to both sides. There's characters in the game that kind of represent both sides of this argument. The problem is that one of these sides of the argument is pretty much solely represented by Team Plasma. Oh boy. Team Plasma are led by Getsis and they seem to believe in Pokemon liberation. They think that catching and owning and battling Pokemon is cruel, and that they deserve to be free. For all intents and purposes, they probably have a very solid argument. There's probably a lot of things to be discussed in regards to how ethical it is to catch and basically own Pokemon, but unfortunately, pretty much every time Getsis or a member of Team Plasma talk, this song plays. So like, as if it wasn't already enough of a tip-off that they were the bad guys from the fact that they are, you know, the team, they're the, the organisation of this game, uh, and gets this by his dialogue and appearance alone as somehow an even more obvious villain than Lysander from X and Y. Now you've also got this creepy Bond villain ass theme played every single time one of them opens their mouth. The game seems to pretend like it's presenting a morally interesting argument to you, and like it's gonna play both sides and, and and give you solid reasoning for either side of the argument, but it's totally not because it, it makes it abundantly clear to anyone over the age of three that these guys who represent this side of the argument, the side of the argument that in the real world would be very legitimate, are just the bad guys. But it gets worse because they're, they're going to defecate all over the moral complexity of this game's plot way later on, but before we get to that, we need to open a can of worms. A can of stupid, cryptic, green-haired worms. 
N is a character. I <laughs> I really don't know where to start with N. He's the exception to the rule of evil characters solely representing the Pokemon liberation side of the argument, but he's also super cryptic for seemingly no reason. It's hard to tell whether you think he's a good guy or a bad guy from your first meeting, but he's always spouting off about truth and ideals and all this other nonsense that doesn't really mean anything. Truth and ideals are supposedly running themes of these games. They are are apparently represented by Reshiram and Zekrom respectively, but I don't really get how. I don't see how this truth and ideals theme is ever really given any kind of meaningful context. It's just like something that you hear characters talk about a lot, but like I say, it's, it's never really given any kind of meaning or any kind of weight. It just feels like they're just saying stuff. And that's pretty much exactly what N does. He just kind of says things to you that don't really mean anything. Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't really feel like we ever get to find out exactly why N is like this. I know that he has a backstory where like he was orphaned and, and grew up in a woods with some Pokemon and then Getsus appeared and claimed to be his dad and then raised him to be like the puppet leader of Team Plasma. And, and I guess that would mess you up as a kid. But And this is just kind of conjecture on my part, but I don't feel like it would make you weird in this way. It would make you weird in some kind of way, but it wouldn't just make you so cryptic and rambly. Th this point is quite subjective. Objective, I concede and if you disagree then I think that's completely understandable but that's just kind of my reading of the character I really don't think the character makes much sense or is ever really explained very well but if you don't agree then that's completely fine but if you want to talk about things that don't make much sense and aren't explained very well we've got to talk about that one line that one line in the game that really just bothers me so much in so many ways and that I think is just the peak of N's unexplained weirdness and not just N's unexplained unexplained weirdness but a lot of the unexplained weirdness around team plasma and that's when you uh decide <laughs> you decide to ride the ferris wheel with him sure seems like a good idea he's not weird at all you get in the ferris wheel with him and then at the very top he tell he gives you this big dramatic reveal and he tells you i am the king of team plasma what king 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 of Team, so your vague crime syndicate now has a monarchy. How does that work? Where's the queen? Where's anything? Why are you the king? Why do I care? What does this mean to me? When N tells me that he is the king of Team Plasma, what does that mean? Aside from the opening cutscene on the home screen, which most players just skip in the first two seconds anyway, there's been no reference whatsoever to Team Plasma having a monarchy for whatever reason, or having a king. So when he tells you he's the king, then I guess it means he's the leader. But why not just say he's the leader, right? Like, why why is he the king? There's never been a king in a previous Pokemon game in any of the vague villainous crime syndicates or teams. So why now? Can, can you tell how dumbfounded I am by this and, and how silly? I think it is. I just, I just don't see the need for it. Why is this a thing? A statement like this that is built up so much just has no stakes or no meaning to you whatsoever because you don't know anything about the inner infrastructure of Team Plasma or how it works. You know, King doesn't mean anything to you. It's a dumb thing to build up in the first place, but if he just said, I'm the leader of Team Plasma, it might have a bit of weight. This might seem like a silly thing to criticize, but I would like to remind you that you're at the top of a Ferris wheel. Like this is this is a cutscene that they, they go out of their way in the game to make you experience. They're clearly trying to build this up like it's some kind of big deal, and it is the frailest thing. To me, it is just the height of nonsensical melodrama that is everywhere in this game. But hold on, viewer, I ain't done yet. Somehow, after all this, there is still one more fatal flaw with this game's story. It is the final nail in the coffin that they hammer in so obnoxiously at the end of the game. The twist that everyone saw coming Getsis and N's father-son relationship was a ruse all along and Getsis had just been manipulating N. Everything that N thought he knew was a lie and Getsis had just been using him for personal gain to get power for Team Plasma and to try and acquire one of the legendary Pokemon. So I said earlier that this game seemed like it was playing to both sides of the argument that it poses and that my problem with the game game is that it's incredibly clear which side of the argument it leans to as a result of which characters they use to represent certain sides of the argument. N was the only character who wasn't blatantly evil that stood for the side of Pokemon Liberation. Shortly after he discovers Getsus's manipulation, the game just kind of ends and you don't really get to know where he stands.
stands anymore. Even if he still stands for Pokemon Liberation, then he's the sole non-evil person who does so, and it doesn't matter anymore. He disappears. The plot is over. It's done. Pokemon Black and White asks a very interesting question. Is it okay to catch Pokemon and kind of use them to your will? Are they happy like that? And then it gives you the answer. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It just is. It's it's fine. All of the people who thought otherwise are irredeemable bad guys. There you go. Moral ambiguity, moral complexity, get out. In regards to Getsis and N's characters and their motivations, this twist does make quite a lot of sense because one of the few things that is made clear and easy to understand about N is that he can talk to Pokemon or he has some kind of way of, of communicating with them, probably because he was orphaned as a child and grew up with Pokemon in the woods. And it makes sense that Getsis would want to use that part of N to try and get to the legendary Pokemon for power because N can communicate with them. The problem is that this twist just completely tramples over the point of the game. Any intrigue you had is gone. You're just given the objectively correct answer. And as a result of this twist, I feel like people are going to try and argue that N calls himself the King of Team Plasma because maybe that's kind of an overblown title that Getsis gave to him and he gave him these kind of delusions of grandeur to further his manipulation. But to that, I'd say, well, it's never really explained or honed in on in the story at all. So that would be a very subtle piece of storytelling that they'd be doing there. And judging by this twist at the end, I really have no faith in them whatsoever to be doing subtle storytelling here. It's such a shame to see such a complex and interesting talking point with so much potential just be so truly and utterly squandered. The game concludes shortly after this twist and all the characters who had been telling you all along that Pokemon are okay battling and, and doing whatever you want them to do are just kind of like well shit I guess we were right all along that's that you know like it's not left open-ended as a question that you can ponder after the game is over there's your answer that's why I hate the plot of Pokemon black and white it's not like there's any reason really given to why Pokemon shouldn't be liberated other than a bunch of characters just kind of telling you that they like it and I guess maybe that's true and maybe I shouldn't really be mad about that but to me it just paints a very strange world of very strange masochistic creatures that I'm not sure I want to go back to anytime soon. It, it really weirds me out to think about that. Like the fact that they gave us an answer isn't necessarily the worst thing ever by itself. It's just how ham-fisted it was done. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm probably not actually as frustrated by this story as it seems, but it's a combination of the story and the praise that it got. So many people praise Black and White for having the best story of a main Pokemon game and even with the completely bare bones stories that were told in the previous games I actually still don't think that was true by the time of generation 5. Final final thing I'm gonna say in regards to the plot is if you're one of those guys who's like what well, is a game for kids why does it matter that much you know the plot isn't a big deal so that I'd say why did they try then? Why did they try in the first place? And additionally, I'd say that just because it's a kid's game, that doesn't mean they have to be pandered to. Maybe some kids would respect and appreciate being treated like they're smarter than that. Maybe they don't want to be spoon-fed the answer, and maybe telling a genuine story with some moral ambiguity and some emotional depth would actually do quite a lot of good for their development as people. I don't like Pokemon Black and White's story. That much should be obvious by now. But I do respect it. This video is called Pokemon Black and White When Everything Changed and it's called that for a reason. I loved Pokemon Generation 4. I loved Generations 2 through 4. I've said as much in previous videos but I will say that when I finished Generation 4 I was kind of pining for something new. I think most people would agree that for the first four generations Pokemon was playing it very safe. The direction that they took for Generation 5 was significantly bolder than anything they'd ever done before and I think you kind of have to respect that. Focus on story is not an inherently bad thing with a Pokemon game. Obviously, I don't like the end result and the execution, but I really admire that these games put a focus on the story and tried to accentuate a feature of the games that hadn't really been honed in on before. Whether I like it or not, the story was given the time of day, and that was fresh. Additionally, Black and White introduced the most new Pokemon of any previous Pokemon game. 156. That's a lot. And while I've complained about the Pokemon designs a lot in this video, I was actually discussing my thoughts 
thoughts on black and white on Twitter with someone not long ago, and they said something that on the surface seemed really simple, but something that just kind of never occurred to me, and something that kind of changed my mind on things a little bit. I was talking about how I find quite a lot of the designs to be pretty hideous, and I, I thought across the board, for the most part, black and white's designs were quite bad, but the guy said in retort that it stands to reason that you're not going to like some of the designs because they've never introduced this many new Pokemon at one time, and yeah, I, like I say, it's so simple that I kind of can't believe that it never came to my mind, but yeah, I, I guess that is fair enough. When they're introducing this many new Pokemon, you're bound to not like a few, and granted, I dislike more than a few, but then, you know, they have a bigger sample size than ever before, and I still respect the approach that they took here. I really love that the only Pokemon you can encounter in these games are the new Pokemon. There's no playing up to nostalgia, which has long been a curse of the main series Pokemon games. I've complained about nostalgia baiting in Generation 6 and 7 before, but Generation 5 is absolutely not guilty of that. They are very bold games that wanted to try and take the series in a different direction, and like I say, whether I like the execution or not, I kind of have to respect that. It was, for all intents and purposes, exactly what I wanted until I played it. Well, wait, actually, hold on. I'm not about to let these games off the hook for nostalgia baiting just yet. There is one weird little thing I've noticed. Let me ask you a question. What's your favourite rock-type Pokemon who evolves at level 25 and then again by trading? Geodude, right? Or is it maybe Rog and Roller? It's not the same level in this example, but who's your favourite fighting-type Pokemon who you catch early on in the game is Mono Fighting-type, uh, evolves in their mid-level 20s and then again by trade. Is it Machop or is it Timber? Who's your favourite bat Pokemon who you catch in basically every cave in the game, especially in the early ones? Is it Zubat? Is it Woobat? Oh! Very, very suspicious game freak. For the record, I don't actually class this as nostalgia baiting. It could be a weird coincidence. I think there's a few too many of these Pokemon that are like very similar in concept and design and their evolution methods to ones of previous generations for it to just be a coincidence, but it's also not that bad. I think it's probably likely that they just kind of went back to the well a little bit and it, you know, it's not not great thing to see, but uh, Black and White is still a hell of a lot less nostalgia bent than other games, so I'll let it off here. You get off free this time, Gen 5ers. This might seem like a weird comparison at first, but I really view Pokemon Generation 5 as kind of the last Jedi of the Pokemon franchise. Both were additions into long-standing series that were bent on change. A lot of Star Wars' predecessors before The Last Jedi were bent on focusing on the past and kind of rehashing a lot of the stuff that had been done before especially in the case of The Force Awakens. And while Pokemon wouldn't really start badly playing up to nostalgia until after Black and White, Black and White was very much still a bold direction that said, forget about the past, this is the present. I really respect the approach of both of these things. I wanted to like them so much. I remember seeing The Last Jedi and being so ready to love it because of how adventurous it was being, and then being so miffed at the, in my opinion, greatly botched execution. And that's pretty much how I feel about Black and White as well. I really wanted to like it because it was trying to be different and daring and new and then I just had so many issues with it and it's sad because I really really wanted to love it. It's funny that I should bring this up because if you've seen the X and Y video then you would have heard me talk about how on paper considering everything I've said about Pokemon before it feels like X and Y games that I should hate but games that I actually wound up quite liking and I feel like the exact opposite is true for Black and White. Black and White doesn't really do anything that I've complained about in regards to X and Y or Sun and Moon, you know, it doesn't nostalgia bait, it doesn't really hold your hand too much. Crucially, because of much less intrusive characters than, say, Sun and Moon, the games do feel like an adventure, which is something that I said in the X and Y video is, to me, the most important thing for a Pokemon game to nail. That is something that I can give to Black and White. They do feel like an adventure. Because of this bold and different direction, Black and White, to me, is when everything changed with the Pokemon series. In my opinion, I don't think they ever really played it as safe as the first four generations again. I know a lot of people criticise Generation 6 for being very safe and very samey, but to that I'd say, well, they did have the whole jump to fully 3D to think about, so there was there was quite a lot going on there. And yeah, there is a lot of nostalgia baiting and, and playing it kind of safe, but I don't think it's that bad. There was some interesting plot-related stuff going on. I think there was a decent amount of focus on an actual decent and interesting plot, even if it was kind of not really fully fleshed out. Mega Evolutions were a pretty big deal, even if I don't love how they were handled. And then, of course, Sun and Moon, it 
it played it safe in a lot of ways. It really did in a lot of ways that I don't think people really talk about. But, you know, getting rid of the gym system and getting rid of HMs was a pretty big deal. And I don't think any games prior to Black and White had really made changes that big. I do think that the series has changed since Black and White. Not hugely as a whole, but as far as Pokemon games go, you know, games that are infamous for kind of doing the same thing over again and sticking to the formula, I'd say they're pretty seismic in comparison. I mean, aside from this renewed focus on plot and the entirely new cast of Pokemon who are the only ones you encounter, look at all the other new and exciting things that Black and White brought in. Rotation and triple bat. <laughs> no, but, but these other two changes were like a, a pretty big deal. Despite not doing much of any of the things that I've criticised both X and Y and Sun and Moon for, Black and White does a lot of small little things that just kind of continue to bother me. Previous Pokemon games took place in regions that had interesting geographies and shapes that made them look like real places on a map. Uh, Unova is a circle. Additionally, I don't love the region of Unova and traversing it that much. I feel like a lot of it is just cities and towns, right? Am I going crazy and thinking that? I don't, I don't really think I can think of very many memories memorable locations, and even the ones that were memorable, like say Castelia City to me, was kind of just a pain in the ass to get around. I, I don't like Castelia City very much. I don't like a lot of the cities and the towns in the game. And then aside from that, what else is there? There's, there's two towers, which like... Eh. Uh, there's Twist Mountain. Twist Mountain can fuck right off. Pinwheel Forest? I don't know. I feel like I'm having a reach kind of hard here. I don't love the soundtrack very much. I don't know if that's controversial, but for me, Black and White has one of the least memorable soundtracks of any Pokemon game. There's obviously a few good songs in there, as is the case with basically any soundtrack, but for the most part, I think it's pretty weak. That's another subjective one, though, I, I completely admit. Another little nitpicky subjective one. What happened to the, the evolution methods, and in particular, the evolution levels of certain Pokemon. Why does Dano not evolve for the first time until level 50? In the previous generation, by this time, you would have had a fully evolved Garchomp. Larvesta doesn't evolve into Volcarona until level 59? What a weird and random level. Volibee and Rufflet don't evolve until level 54. What gives? You, you can't even get them till right near the end of the game. So screw your chances of using either of these guys on your team. They evolve into, pretty much undeniably in my opinion, two of the coolest Pokemon in the game. Because of how weirdly late you catch them and how weirdly late they evolve, you've got basically no chance of using the evolved forms of Rufflet or Volibee be until like Victory Road and the Elite Four are probably the earliest. And I guess you could at the very least say that you would get to use them in the post game. And you know what? That'd be fair enough. Both of these games have great, very content filled, very vast post games up there with the best in the series. And that is a big positive for Black and White. That being said, call me a Pokemon boomer, but I'm just used to catching Spiro early on in the game. I get him to level 20, he evolves. Bam. There's Spiro. And then nowadays in this game, I can't catch Rufflet until like five minutes before the champion fight and he doesn't even evolve until I marathon the fucking Lord of the Rings trilogy with him. If there was some kind of in-game explanation as to why Pokemon in Unova evolve so much later than in other regions, I think that'd be really cool actually. It could contribute a lot to some genuine world building, but instead it just kind of is the way it is and it feels really jarring. Like I say, Dano doesn't evolve the first time until level 50 and then if you want him to get to his final stage of evolution, you've got to hit level 60. Four. I believe that's the highest level requirement for any Pokemon evolution ever, right? Like even now to this day, nothing's gone higher than that. And I'm, I'm kind of just like, why? I guess it's not inherently a problem because there has to be a highest requirement. But why here? Why now? Is it the post game? I guess the post game would be a fair enough explanation. But like I say, it just still feels very jarring. What's up with this thing they do with the first gym? This is like the definition of thinking so hard about whether you can do something and not about whether or not you should do something. You always fight the gym leader who has the elemental monkey that is super effective against your starter Pokemon. So most of the time you're basically forced to get the other monkey who is super effective against that monkey, almost immediately making your starter decision feel kind of redundant. 95% of people are just getting them out of necessity anyway because nobody wants to use them long term on a team because they're pretty lame and they kind of suck. There's something about this red one, I can't quite put my finger on it. <sighs> I think I've done it. I think I've exhausted 
all of the critiques I have for these games. And before I kind of wrap up and address an elephant in the room, I do want to give one last piece of praise to Black and White, a real glowing piece of praise. And that's, uh, I, I said I've, I've complained about the plot a lot, but I haven't necessarily complained about all of the characters. There is a character in Pokemon Black and White who is the closest that a main series Pokemon game has ever gotten to a genuinely complex and interesting character. And if you haven't already figured out who it is, it's Cherin. Throughout the game, Cherin is constantly in conflict with himself, trying to figure out the best way to make his Pokemon the best they can be. Does he have to be loving and caring like so many preach about, or does he have to be hard-nosed and focused on optimization through training? And watching his kind of evolution throughout the game, his character arc, right? What a novel concept and how his thoughts and feelings change. It's genuinely interesting and it's satisfying to see the conclusion that he comes to and, and how much he learns. It'd be so easy to just turn this character into the villain, but he's just complex, you know? He's just interesting and he's far and away, in my opinion, the best character of any main series Pokemon game. And between this and one scene with Bianca in Nimbasa City, the game does show the potential to have some real interesting and emotional moments, and it's, as I say, such a shame to see it all marred by this Team Plasma gets this nonsense that is going on. I assume at some point during this video, Pokemon Black and White 2 have come to mind. I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but for obvious reasons I think they are worth a mention. I didn't play them at the time of release because obviously I wasn't too fond of Black and White, it was the first time that I ever didn't play the follow-up to a main series Pokemon game, but I initially skipped Black and White 2. And since then, I've heard very good things and been recommended these games by a lot of people, so earlier this year I finally got around to playing them. I haven't finished them yet, I just beat the fifth gym. Um, they're better. They are better than Black and White in my opinion. I'm just having more fun with them. You know, as much as I've praised having nothing but new Pokemon in Black and White, I've also said that I don't like a lot of them, so having a lot of returning Pokemon in Black and White 2 has been very refreshing. I can use Electabuzz, that's cool. And while from what I've seen so far, there doesn't really seem to be too much going on with the plot, at least it hasn't angered me like Black and Whites did, I would say that I am enjoying Black and White 2 more, but I still wouldn't exactly say that I like them. I'd say that they're better than Black and White, but I don't really think they fix a lot of the core problems that I have with the original Black and White. But then again, like I say, I haven't finished them, so the jury is kind of still out. I really didn't realise how controversial an opinion it was to not like Black and White until a while ago when I was talking about it publicly on my Twitter, and I just had quite a lot of people in my mentions disagreeing with me, and that's fine, I enjoyed the conversation, I enjoyed the discourse, I've enjoyed talking about Black and White today. Because I'll say this, I still don't like Pokemon Black and White. I don't, I have too many issues with them. But, I can't... I couldn't make a video about Black and White like I did with Sun and Moon. I'm I'm pretty confident that I could make a very solid argument for Pokemon Sun and Moon just being bad games. And I don't think I could make that same argument for Black and White, because you've probably noticed a running theme throughout this video, and that is that a hefty majority of my issues with Black and White are very subjective, and I totally admit that. A lot of my problems are just opinions. They're very nitpicky little things, things that bother me personally, sure, but not a lot of things that I can really argue are objectively bad, aside from maybe the story but even then, that feels very kind of touch and go, right? I'm sure someone could make a solid argument as to why the story is in fact good, and I'm full of shit. It's honestly a little bit frustrating to not like these games because of everything they do right. These were the last main series Pokemon games where the experience share didn't completely break the game. And it doesn't really set a foot wrong in terms of core gameplay and design. I've previously praised the sprite animations that give the Pokemon so much more life. I still love these. They're such a great addition. The season cycle was a nice idea. I don't actually think it really affected very much or ever really came into play very much, but it was a cool thing to see implemented regardless. The way the trainers talk to you during the battle. The cool little graphic that flashes up before an important battle. There's a ton of cool stuff in this game and it's a shame that I don't feel like it could outweigh the admittedly kind of petty problems that I had with it. Because when I try and look at things more objectively I think there's just no way that I could possibly say that these games are bad. Just ones that don't do it for me. Do I like Pokemon Black and White? Do I enjoy Pokemon Black and White? No, not really. But I do respect Pokemon Black and White. 
Light, and that's a hell of a lot more than I can say about Sun and Moon. These games did take a very respectable direction. To put it simply, I think Game Freak had the right idea with these games. For me, the execution just didn't work. So that's that. Pokemon Black and White for me, unfortunately kind of started this downward spiral for Pokemon. I had my fun with X and Y, but obviously had issues with it. Sun and Moon, as far as I'm concerned, were dreadful. Uh, I haven't really enjoyed a main series Pokemon game as much as I did Generation 4 since Generation 4, and obviously that wasn't even my favourite. And thus brings an end to my trilogy of talking about the last three generations of Pokemon, and how I think they changed things, and how interesting I think they are to talk about in relation to one another. As far as Pokemon is concerned, I'm signing out. Well, I'm not quite signing out yet, am I? I suppose there is something else on the horizon. One more fish to fry. One that I have very little faith in. One that, based on what I've seen, seems to be an amalgamation of a lot of the things I hate about what the series has become. But I will save my verdict for when I play it, and I hope you'll look forward to the video in either November or December, whenever it will be, depending on how much time I feel I need to digest what I've played. In the meantime, I would greatly appreciate it if you could like and subscribe and do all that crazy stuff as any YouTuber would. This was a very long, painstaking video to make. And hey, I mean, if you enjoyed it, then... Uh, I'm like this a lot, right? Like, all my other videos are more or less like this, so if you enjoyed me, you want more of me, then uh, come come get some more of me. I'm on tap tonight, baby. <laughs> Ooh, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking now. Bye.